Anyone familiar with the upper tier of North America would likely recognize the handsome white or paper birch tree. With its paper-thin, white, peeling bark, it's hard to miss. There are six species of birch in New England, four of which are primarily forest trees. We'll look at all six. First, two that are not really forest dwellers. A primarily northeastern species that is easily confused with the paper birch is the gray birch. This is a small, short-lived tree that often shows up in dry, sunny locations, such as abandoned fields and roadsides. Compared to the paper birch, it has a more sooty appearance and black triangular markings under the branches, and can be identified by its triangular-shaped leaves, as opposed to the more rounded leaves of the paper birch. Once the gray birch becomes shaded out by longer-lived trees, it soon dies out. It doesn't survive in a forest. Another species that can, at least when young, look like the paper birch is the river birch. As a young tree, the river birch has salmon-colored, peeling, papery bark, somewhat similar to the white birch. Because of its beautiful young bark, it's often planted as an ornamental. But this is a tree that loves water. It's never found far from it. It's found along rivers, streams, ponds, and other wet areas. It is often found growing in clumps. Its thin bark soon transforms into a more rugged looking plate-like structure. The more mature bark still has tinges of that salmon color in it. The primary range of this tree is the southeastern quarter of the United States, but it does range up into central New England. This handsome tree is over eight feet in circumference. It's growing on the banks of the Merrimack River in eastern Massachusetts. The river birch's need for sunlight is apparent in this tree. All its limbs hang over the river. On an old tree such as this, the bark of the river birch resembles that of a pine tree. Let's now look at the birches of the forest. The paper birch is a forest dweller. It often appears in numbers after a forest fire, but ironically is quickly killed by even the smallest of fires. As the tree matures, the bark takes on a darker, rougher appearance. Once a birch does go down, it quickly decomposes on the ground. It will be gone in a couple of frogs' lives. In the northeast, there is another almost identical white birch called the mountain or heart-leafed birch, so named for the shape of its leaves. Casual woods walkers may or may not know this tree as the black birch or the sweet birch. This is the tree that first brought us birch beer. Scratch the bark of its twigs with your thumbnail and you'll be treated to the fragrance of wintergreen. Maybe you recognize those black birch trees, but would you recognize this tree? It's another birch. In fact, it's the same black birch tree, only a much older, larger version. Surprised? A lot of people are when they find out what that tree is. Bob Leverett is an expert on old growth forests. He's been studying and measuring trees for decades and knows a lot about the birches, among many other species. For many years, Bob has been leading very enthusiastic groups of people into our forests to share his expertise with them, and it's always an enjoyable outing. We have an ongoing project with Bob to learn more about and to document these beautiful sweet birches of the forest. Let's join Bob now. I'm standing here in Mount Tom State Reservation with my hand on a species that uh, most people think of as a very small tree or at best a medium sized tree, but most people attempting to identify it in a forest wouldn't identify this one as Betula linta or the black birch. 
The black birch is a very different species from what accounts, oftentimes internet account, tree ID books, would make it out to be. I, it's not that small. This tree is close to nine feet in circumference, and it's pushing a hundred feet in height. And that's not a small tree for these New England woods at all. In addition, contrasting to the pictures of this species shown at an early age when the bark is gray to black that reflect, oh, 30, 60 years or, or younger. And most people know this tree through that bark, but it looks very different when it's much older. Bark fractures, divides up into plates. And if we were to consider all of the data that we have spread from northern New England to the middle of the south, we would find isolated examples of this species living to between 350 and almost 400 years. That's a very different picture from the one that I just painted. Well, it turns out that Mount Tom State Reservation is a location where we find a lot of very mature birches, like this one. And we want to explore the history of this species and see it for all of its glory. Let's take a look at uh, some younger ones. And I mentioned, I think, previously that the uh, bark of the younger tree is fairly smooth and gray or gray-black. It has the little breathing holes and uh, that is often the uh, drawing or the photograph uh, shown in tree guides. These trees are not old. They're you know, 40, 30 or 40 years old maybe. And uh, they, uh, they grow very rapidly in height, but they grow very slowly in circumference or, or diameter. So you can get a lot of wispy birches that most people will almost not notice when walking through the forest. And that's pretty much the tree that gets described in, in the books as opposed to the older ones that we've seen. How large, how old uh, does the species get to? And again, I point out that this is not common knowledge. If you look up maximum uh, dimensions or even maximum age on most uh, sources, they're simply wrong. The birch uh, can, in the southern Appalachians, get to be about a 13-foot circumference tree, although not, not very often. In New England here, 8 to 10 feet tends to push the limit in terms of, of circumference. Height is the real surprise. It is not uncommon that we measure these trees to between 100 and 110 feet. Above that, uh, not much. Uh, in the southern Appalachians, they can go to a little more, almost 120 feet. And that would pretty much crop it off for the species. Age-wise, many will go over 200 years, a few will go over 300, and a very few will approach even 400. That's a lot different from what you would read, which would often talk about 150 years as being the maximum longevity for the species. Not so. These trees start out pretty fast. And then they slow down, and then they can grow very, very slowly for a hundred years or more. And that's what I think fools a lot of people in terms of what they, the ages they actually can reach. Here we have a, uh, one of the old and large black birch on Mount Tom. It uh, measures 9.2 feet in circumference at four and a half feet above mid slope. And I'm guessing that it's about somewhere in the 200 year age range. It may be uh, a good bit older than that, uh, 250 as much as po possible. Trees like this, there's not a lot of places in New England where you can find them. Mature black birch forests are relatively rare, and it gives people a false view of what the species eventually turns into. And so Mount Tom is a very valuable forest for us to understand black birch ecology. The birches produce pollen in male structures called catkins, shown here, and the seeds are produced in female catkins that resemble small cones. The seeds mature in autumn, and throughout the winter the wind blows the scales off the cone one layer at a time, dispersing the seeds across the snow. 
These seeds are so tiny, they don't have much stored energy, so they can't put down heavy roots. They need to land on bare soil or some similar substrate in order to germinate and grow. If you look on the snow under the birches, you can often see the thousands of scales and seeds lying about. A wind-thrown tree that pulls up a mound of bare soil is an ideal place for birch seeds to sprout. Birch seeds are very small, and when they fall into the duff layer leaves, uh, predominantly that haven't decayed and form a mat, then the birch seedlings often don't make it. Uh, they need mineral soil or organic material that they can uh, um, use. Well, one, one place is on old logs. Hemlocks, for example, are ideal for birches to reseed on, so we would call this a nurse log. And here are some birch seedlings coming up, future birch of the forest. Of course, there are others that didn't require that. They may have fell on an area that had been washed clean of its uh, uh, organic matter and have ex exposed mineral soil. But uh, trees like this, down trees like this, nurse logs are an important place for birches to reseed in a closed canopy forest. When the birch seeds germinate on top of an old stump and send their roots down the side, that can result in some strange looking trees once the stump rots away. Birch seedlings often sprout at the uh, edge of a rock ledge. The roots grow into the soil bank uphill and it leaves the birch perched at the edge of the rock. We find this form very common and oftentimes rather artistic. We sometimes have contests on, on photographing the most uh, interesting forms of birches. This is a young one. We will show you later m much more impressive and older ones doing the same kind of thing. Black birches are not very shade tolerant. They require light. When this large oak tree went down in the forest, it created an opening in the canopy that provided the sunlight that the black birch seeds on the ground there needed to sprout and grow. Experts at bending and twisting to find the light, black birches sometimes do some strange contortions to get to it. One of the characteristics I find most appealing about black birches is the unique bluish-green lichens that grow on the bark of some of the trees. We've lost a lot of our dense hemlock cover due to an insect called a hemlock woolly adelgid. The forest gaps created by the loss of these fallen trees creates an opportunity for black birch to take hold. Black birch has also exploited gaps caused by the loss of the chestnut. And when many oak trees were killed off by gypsy moths, black birch took that opportunity as well. And in some places, the birches have really thrived Another possible factor that might favor the black birch is the fact that white-tailed deer don't browse on the seedlings and saplings. So in areas where deer populations are heavy, they may give an advantage to the black birch by eating the competing species of trees. Black birch is also able to grow in dense fern stands where other species of trees cannot. One of the stems of this multi-trunk tree broke off and fell in a windstorm which gave us the opportunity to count the annual rings in the fallen trunk. The count was 108 years, and that was a couple feet above ground level, so the tree is most likely several years older than 108. It was 14 inches in diameter at that age. Another similarly sized tree had a ring count of 128 years at a couple feet above ground level. This gnarly old sweet birch grows in the Mount Tom range along an old stone wall, which tells us it probably began its life in a pasture. We don't know its age, but it's most likely one of the oldest black birches in the Mount Tom range and probably the state of Massachusetts. 
Its thickly plated bark looks nothing like a young black birch anymore, and few people would likely recognize this as a black or sweet birch. In some of the older forests of Massachusetts are found some of the finest black birch in all of New England. Across the Connecticut River from the Mount Tom Range, there are many more magnificent black birches in Skinner State Park. Bob Leverett is measuring a gorgeous black birch with the help of Bill Finn. circumference, about an 85 foot height, uh, those are impressive statistics. But what's really impressive is the artistry of the tree. If you start from the base and you look upward, let your eyes be carried up into the crown, the architecture of the crown speaks to age, craigness, the passage of many seasons. It is a wise old tree. There simply is no better time to appreciate the beauty of the birches than in the fall, when the air is filled with the heady fragrance of hay-scented fern and newly fallen leaves. And when the leaves are off the trees, it's much easier to use the laser to measure the tree's height. The impressive numbers keep piling up in Bob's database, and his mission to document black birches that exceed the commonly quoted heights is paying off handsomely. Do you recognize this birch? This is a yellow or silver birch. And we're going to go to the Deerfield River Gorge area of Western Massachusetts to find out more about these. The steep, rocky terrain of this mountainside is home to black, yellow, and some white birch. I'm standing on uh, an outcropping of schist uh, rock, uh, a heavily metamorphosed uh, rock very old and on top of it are some fairly old trees yellow birches and one black birch and this is what yellow birches seem to do best they drop their seeds which are very fine sometimes as many as 45,000 per pound and uh, they light on the, the, the tops of rocks and organic matter and uh, take hold and then they grow and then they extend their roots down around and grip the rock and uh, lasts for 100, 200, sometimes even 300 years in this kind of environment. They create a Tolkien-esque uh, landscape uh, that's very appealing. Henry David Thoreau, Yellow Birch was his favorite of the three. Hiking into the forest along a beautiful New England mountain stream, we start picking up yellow birches. Bob has been coming here for decades exploring, measuring, and documenting all the tree species here. As with black birch, if you scratch the bark on a young yellow birch twig, you'll also get that great wintergreen fragrance, although not as strong as the black birch. This is very steep, rugged, rocky terrain, which is probably what saved this old growth forest area. A really picturesque old yellow birch. You could say this is the land of birches and boulders. 
The water draining down these hillsides into the brook provides perfect habitat for species like yellow birch. This north-facing slope is always a very moist environment and is particularly lush in the summertime. The duff layer on the forest floor of this mountainside is very spongy and dense, holding a lot of the moisture. The decomposing hulks of old fallen trees and the wet boulders are perfect substrates for mosses. The birches share this terrain here in Monroe State Forest with other tree species such as white pine, hemlock, sugar maple, white ash, beech, and others. Even big tooth aspen. So what do we have here, Bob? We have a, uh, an old yellow birch, maybe I would say above 200 years, maybe 250 and it's mixed in with younger trees, not too uncommon to find a mix of young and old along the stream corridors. And this one is illustrative of what birch do. In order to get to light, they tend to grow out. Of course, this one is tipped because of the bank, but then it curves back up and finds a, a hole in the canopy. And birch do that about as well or better than any other species I know of. Well, two things that Thoreau had really admired about trees were their tenacity and how well they stand their ground. And this yellow birch is a perfect example. Grab and hold of that rock any way it can. Sometimes it's hard to tell where the rock stops and the tree begins. The timeless, soothing sounds of a mountain stream, soft, moist earth underfoot, the fragrance of fallen leaves, and a breeze in the tall treetops. These are treats for the senses. And looking at an old yellow birch, and when we say old, we're always curious as to how old, but as you can see, that this one, the outer bark is split and broken up and starting to get into platelets and that young curly yellow early bark is largely gone so it's not a young tree but we are very interested in seeing if we can correlate the pattern of breakup with general age it won't be exact but it'll be in the ballpark and this one we we would imagine this tree is about 170 years old maybe maybe a little younger or maybe a little older well, here we are next to a, a handsome yellow birch with a very large burl on it. And this, this was a tree that uh, Henry David Thoreau really loved. Uh, there weren't so many of them in Concord in his day. And when he, he found a, a, a whole stand of them in January of 1853, and he was stunned by their beauty. It was right during the period of the California gold rush. And Thoreau said that the the golden yellow of that tree meant more to him than the gold of California. At 13.5 feet in circumference, this was the largest of the yellow birches that Bob found in this area. The wood of our three forest birches, the white, the yellow, and the black, is hard and dense and has been used for fine furniture and cabinetry. In fact, in the southern Appalachians, black birch was known as mountain mahogany, because as it darkened with age, the heartwood resembled mahogany. The birches have been used traditionally for a number of medicinal purposes. White birch bark is well known for its use in making canoes and baskets and other small items. As late as the 1950s, young black birch trees were being harvested and sold by the ton to be distilled into the oil of wintergreen made from it. The birch oil was used as a flavoring agent in all kinds of foods and medicines and drinks. Throughout time, 
The birches have benefited both man and animal in many ways. Some would say the birch's loftiest purpose is just being part of the forest. Northern woodlands would be diminished without the grace and poise of the white birch, the lady of the forest. The tall, straight trunks of old black birch are a joy to see, but the bent and gnarly ones growing out of impossible places hold a special place in my heart. And the yellow birch, the raptor of the rocks, invokes a sense of wilderness and wild, untamed lands. These are the birches of the forest.